Ready? We'll go. So um, I'm going to do a little introduction uh, since the people on the tape didn't see this before. So in 2004 the, or 2003, thereabouts, the National Science Foundation wanted to know if they could uh, afford to build a new Alvin submarine uh, to do deep, deep submersion science over the next 50 years or so. And so they commissioned a study from the National Academy of Sciences um, to look at future needs. And a lot of that, mostly it was the future needs of the people who were going to uh, be using the vessel, but they also wanted to know if the $25 million they had in their budget uh, was sufficient to, to build the ship. So it turns out um, I handed out, and you have here a appendix, which I didn't really, well, I sort of, sort of generated this, this version of it, but most of this was I stole from a report. Woods Hole Oceanographic, which wanted to, uh, would be the operator of this, had done a study uh, in 2003, and they estimated it would cost 6.5 million. Okay, this is the total down here for a, uh, a new Alvin submarine. Now it didn't, if you read the footnote, it didn't include um, design, assembly, certification, and testing. Okay, so they kind of left a few things out. But they had just finished building the Jason II, which is a remotely operated vehicle that went to similar types of depths. And the two big costs are, of course, Jason didn't need a titanium hull because it didn't have any people. It was a remotely operated vehicle. But if you come down here somewhere, you're going to find syntactic foam, a quarter million dollars, out of a Jason cost of 2.3 million. Okay, the total cost of the Jason. But you can see how they broke all this stuff down. And then Woods Hole had estimated the weight um, of uh, a new Alvin and the uh, the cost at 6.5 million. Now, you know, I looked at this and I said, you gotta be kidding me. You can build an unmanned that weighs 7,200 pounds for 2.3 million, and if I calculate that, I think that's about $300 a pound, okay? Or you could build a manned vessel, which you know has got to be more expensive, because there's certain things you have to have on a manned vessel that you don't have to have on a remotely operated. For the weighs 30, 34,000 pounds, and that's going to cost you $200 a pound. So I didn't believe this from the get-go, um, but you can see that on this one, 10% of the cost or 11% of the cost was syntactic foam. What is syntactic foam? Anybody know? You don't know? Yep. Yep, exactly. Uh, and fortunately for the Navy, the uh, um, uh, oil industry is using lots of syntactic foam on their jackup rigs or, you know, and things. Uh, but you need it for buoyancy. And basically, you start out with these little quartz spheres that can take the submergent pressure without collapsing. They're sphere, they're hollow spheres. Not, I say they're made out of quartz. They're made out of a glass, and I think it's uh, it's certainly a very high silica, so it has very high strength, relatively high strength. And then you infiltrate this whole thing with uh, uh, with polymer resin. Okay, the polymer resin has to be something that won't biodegrade or get eaten up by marine organisms, because this stuff is going to be wet for 50 years, right? Um, so it turns out um, they actually end up using a two-size sphere because you can pack more densely. Uh, you can prove to yourself you can pack spheres more densely if you can put, if you packed everything almost completely tight, you would still have interstices. And it turns out if that one is one-sixth the diameter of these, you can fill up some of the holes. Uh, it turns out you can pack with about 50% density um, with one size, with the mono size uh, spheres, and then you infiltrate with with plastic. But if you use a distribution of sphere sizes, you can get higher densities. And I think they're up to like 60 or 70 percent, which is pretty incredible now. And the the relative density, I can't. I used to know it. It was like two pounds two pounds per cubic foot. Okay, and if if water is uh, 
uh, or they're pr approaching. I mean, you can look it up on Google and it'll probably tell you. Um, if water is eight pounds, not, no, 64 pounds a cubic foot. So it was like eight pounds, maybe it was eight pounds, I don't remember. No, tw maybe it was 20 pounds a cubic foot. It was, it was yeah, that's probably right. It's about one third that, about one third the density of water. So you get lots of buoyancy. I mean, it's not an air tank, but if you start trying to build air tanks and pumps and everything that blow out the air tanks, you wouldn't be able to do it. So they, and the other thing about syntactic foam, you can basically machine it, okay? It's a little hard on the tools, but you can use carbide tools and stuff. So you can machine it to whatever shape you want. So if you actually looked at the Alvin itself, inside this outside hull, of course you have the inside hull, which is a sphere, and that sphere is right here, and here's your propulsion, and you've got all kinds of other stuff uh, back here, and you can go to the web and get that stuff. But anyway, every space in here is filled with syntactic foam, machined to just the right shape to fill up all the space inside that out external skin. So syntactic foam was pretty expensive, but just in general, I didn't believe it, so if you actually look in here, uh, my estimate was basically said um, Woods Hole had estimated a titanium sphere cost of two million dollars okay out of 6.5 million so I said but they didn't have design assembly certification so I said well let's double the 6.5 I mean I they wouldn't you thought I was going to go through and do the design analysis and the cost on all this, I mean that would be a half million dollar job, and I'm a volunteer on this. Um, so I had to think of a nice, simple way to do this. I said, well, let's take the 6.5 and make it 13 million, if you include certification and design and assembly and all this other stuff. And that's about right. I gave you this thing from 21st Century Defense Needs that talked about cost of welding is 10 percent, inspection is 10 percent, you know, management is 10 to 20 percent, and all these other things. So if you do that, you kind of say, okay, well, let's take the basic stuff they're talking about here, the components, and then double that for all these other things. And I said, I basically said, what did I say? What did I write? The greatest re risk in meeting the cost estimate of a new HOV is the cost of fabricating the pressure hull, okay? Of all these things on here, uh, the $2 million for the pressure hull was the biggest problem. Uh, and Woods Hole had estimated $2 million in the 2001 estimate of $13 million. I'd taken the six and a half and I just doubled it, okay, to $13 million. Uh, the sources of the original titanium plate in the forging facilities used to fabricate the Alvin and Seacliff titanium pressure holes in the 1970s no longer exist. The United States has extremely limited industrial experience in welding heavy section titanium. Soviets and the Japanese have some. Uh, we could go over there and have them build it for us. Soviets could have done a great job. Believe me, they built these other, anyway. Um, and so I said, basically, um, the, the final report, um, I basically came up with $16 million. But the $16 million is basically almost $10 million above the $6.5 million that Woods Hole was trying to sell the NSF. Because, oh, well, we're not going to, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to pay, who's going to design it? They expected me to design it? I mean, you know, I'm not going to design it. Um, so uh, we determined that for 16 million, you might even be able to buy a, uh, uh, a man submersible and a, uh, maybe another ROV, okay? Uh, the other, one of the other constraints was if this thing was gonna weigh 34,000 pounds, you really couldn't use the sea cliff because the sea cliff was gonna weigh 40,000 pounds because it was a bigger hull, it'd have to be a bigger Alvin. And I think I mentioned you have to come up with a new surface tender. That's a $100 million ship. Uh, and they certainly weren't going to come up with that. They're going to have to do something about that surface tender because that ship's not going to last for 100 years, OK? Um, so in any case, um, then in t they were about to start it. And uh, we had the, I don't know if it's the financial collapse. Actually, I guess the, the big question became, who was really going to fabricate it? And we did do a little bit of looking. Ladish Corporation in Cudahy, Wisconsin, does big forgings for the uh, for the uh, uh, 
um, oil business, and then there's Cameron Iron Works down in Houston. And so there's some people who could make these things, and they make things for the oil industry. But none of them had any experience with titanium since the 1970s when the Navy was funding things. And all that experience had gone away. Those people were retired uh, long, long ago. Um, and we didn't get a, well, it wasn't our job to go out and get quotes. But when they went out to get quotes, um, they, these companies didn't really want to do it. And the first quotes that came in after the study, and we had estimated 16 million, they were coming in at like 24 million, not, not for the whole thing, if, if you kind of. So my 16 million quote, even though I thought it was two and a half times what Woods Hole, you know, I'd done two and a half times what Woods Hole had done, uh, my quote was looking pretty, pretty lame at that point. Uh, the final cost, as I understand it, was about 40 million. Okay, so Woods Hole had six and a half million, cost 40 million. Tom Eager thought he was being very generous by going up by 250 percent over Woods Hole, uh, but Woods Hole didn't make any sense. Like I said, 200 dollars a pound for a heavier vessel that's man-rated, as opposed. You know, uh, common sense said that was a stupid, uh, stupid quote to begin with. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about titanium welding in general, and first talk, like we did in most cases, about titanium alloys. Uh, there's not as much titanium used. Um, I don't know if um, I should have my little thing I showed you in the very beginning. It talks about pounds of material used in the world, or tons of material. So remember, steel is 1.5 billion, titanium is 165,000 okay, tons per year uh, of titanium metal. Now, titanium oxide it goes into paint on the walls, okay, so far as that goes. So they might mine half a million or more uh, a million tons. Uh, of titanium, but most of them are into paint and pigments and things like that. Titanium metal is about 165,000 tons a year. Obviously, a lot of that goes into aerospace. The next largest application is for corrosion resistance. Marine applications are very, very small, okay? Um, but there are marine applications, and the Navy has been leading the charge on heavy section titanium for the last 60 years, okay? Titanium comes in uh, a number of grades, 1 through 12, according to the ASTM, which grades these things. And it turns out, I'll show you later, that well, actually, I'll not be able to show you here. The difference in grades 1 through 4 is basically just increasing oxygen content. Just like carbon-hardened steel, iron, oxygen hardens titanium without a great reduction in properties. Now, if you, the, higher, the, the higher hardness, the lower the toughness and whatnot, so there are some trade-offs. Now, it turns out for some chemical applications, you actually put palladium in there. Palladium is the same price as gold, okay? But there are some very severe corrosion applications where you can get pitting, and if you put a little bit of titanium, uh, palladium in there, you know, you don't usually find something like palladium in, uh, in a uh, metal alloy um, that's not a precious metal. But for some chemical plant applications, even titanium is not good enough resistance for pitting. <coughs> in other cases, they use nickel. Nickel is right above palladium in the periodic table, and it's obviously much less expensive. Uh, there's titanium 6-4. I'll talk about the 6-4 type of alloy in a little bit, but it was developed over here at Watertown Arsenal in, the, in about 1945 or 47 or something, um, when titanium first started to become available. In, uh, larger quantities. Um, there is this alloy, titanium 6211, 6 aluminum, 2 niobium, 1 tantalum, and 0, 08 moly, and they call it TI6211. That is the U.S. Navy TIE 100, 100 KSI strength material. Has no other application that I know of other than the Navy buys it because they did a lot of work at David Taylor to uh, prove it out as the Navy's choice of strength, toughness, uh, weldability, et cetera, back in the 1960s or so. Uh, classification of alloying elements. Mm -hmm. Turns out titanium like steel um, has a transformation. I didn't, well, actually, I can show you this, okay. Um, 
with most alloys or with many alloys, titanium goes from uh, at low temperatures on a phase diagram with alloy content and temperature, uh, titanium at low temperatures is hexagonal close packed. We call that alpha phase. At high temperatures, it's face centered cubic, not face centered, body centered cubic. We call that the beta phase. And you'll, you, as you read about titanium, you'll see alpha and beta and alpha beta phases. Many of them are two phase. Titanium six aluminum four vanadium is two phase alloy, alpha beta. Um, and you, one thing about titanium is one of the most reactive elements with gases in the air. Okay? I guess I can tell a story about that. Uh, but um, in any case, um, the alloying elements that stabilize the alpha phase are aluminum, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. The beta phase is most other things in the periodic table. Um, and the neutral ones are, tit are tin and zirconium. Okay, so we use tin and some zirconium in some of the fancier uh, aircraft alloys and whatnot. You do get precipitation hardening varieties of titanium, but they're mostly used as sheet metal in the aerospace industry, so far as that goes. Um, you can dissolve lots of aluminum into titanium in the beta phase. So here's the titanium aluminum phase diagram, and here's the, oops, let me make sure I got the right side, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the titanium side, uh, and putting aluminum in stabilizes beta, okay? More aluminum you put in, actually, I'm sorry, stabilizes alpha, but you can put a lot of them into the beta phase. Um, if you put too much in, you'll get uh, intermetallics, which you can use as precipitation hard hardeners, but uh, in your beta alloys, but um, in general, you want to balance these so that you have your transformation where you're starting to work it so you can use the advantage just like in steel where you can change the grain size with temperature. Okay, In steel you go to FCC and then you come down um, and you can get a change of grain size to FCC. In titanium you start with uh, BC, you start with BCC and you come down you can go to HCP and you get a reduction in grain size and if you cycle between those you get finer and finer grains to a certain extent and get better toughness and better strength. So titanium does have these different crystal structures, which aluminum does not, and that gives titanium a certain advantage in terms of RPA, being able to produce um, different types of microstructures. Um, typical types of properties in titanium, this is a, out of a materials processing book uh, or magazine. Uh, room temperature fatigue properties, um, the wrought annealed titanium can give you strength. This is 100 KSI. This would be the strength of titanium 100 uh, over here and out at lots of cycles, over a million cycles. So titanium can give you higher strength than steel at lower density, which is obviously one of the reasons why you'd like it for a submersible, because if you're going to spend all this money on syntactic foam, you'd like not to have to have as much syntactic foam. You'd like to have something that automatically comes to the surface. They have built all aluminum deep diving submersibles. The Aluminum Association built the Illuminot back in the 1960s or 70s. Um, you have to use high strength aluminum, and that has corrosion, stress corrosion cracking problems, so that's the only alum all aluminum pressure hull that I've ever heard of. Um, so people tend not to, to do it. Titanium has fantastic corrosion resistance, so it has all those advantages, just a little co costly. Cast titanium ha doesn't have the same types of properties, but if you do hot ice static pressing, you can bring, bring the properties up so that in many cases it's approaching the, uh, the base metal strength. Actually, sometimes it can exceed it, uh, so far as that goes. So I don't think we need to go through that. Um, if we go to the <coughs> room temperature properties of these, this is the pure titanium, commercially pure titanium, grade one, two, three, four, that had higher and higher oxygen. You can see you can go from a yield strength that's not anywhere, not as good as carbon steel, to something that's as good as your high strength aluminum alloys by just changing the oxygen content. And you don't lose too much in uh, elongation from 30% to 20%. Most people use grade two, 
because grade two gives you 45 KSI, uh, which is fine for making heat exchanger tubes. People love, I mean, when I was your age, people would make heat exchanger tubes out of brass or admiralty brass or something like that. And they'd have a 20 or 30 year life. Well, it got to be more and more expensive to replace things, so more and more of the utilities and um, uh, uh, oil companies and stuff started using titanium tubing for these things. Not that titanium tubing won't corrode. Um, I've had um, under deposit corrosion attack on titanium tubes if you just let dirt get in the system. One time in New York, I think I, did I tell you about the titanium fire? These guys were spraying water on a titanium fire and you just, when you do that, you get titanium oxide plus hydrogen and so um, uh, so you actually end up creating a bigger flame because you get hydro you're generating hydrogen when you spray water on titanium uh, that's burning. In any case, um, uh, where was I going with? Uh, I don't remember where I was going with that. Um, so people, oh, you can. They got. They basically let some river water in and they got, they got silt in the bottom of their titanium tubes and they assumed, oh, well, titanium won't corrode. It will corrode underneath a layer of silt, okay? You gotta keep everything clean uh, to prevent corrosion, uh, what they call under deposit attack. Um, so anyway, um, they had to replace the whole titanium heat exchanger. Um, here's your TIE 6211, has 100 KSI yield strength. Uh, the elongation doesn't look great, but it's got actually, uh, they don't show toughness here, but the toughness is, it's designed for, for excellent toughness. Titanium 6.4, 130 KSI, uh, but it's only got 135 um, tensile, so, um, but this is the workhorse alloy for, uh, and actually 150 in the uh, aged condition. Uh, this is the workhorse alloy for a lot of your forgings that go into aircraft and things like that. But the Navy likes their own alloy. <clears throat> it's very expensive to have your own alloy, folks. Uh, but that's what they do. So <clears throat> um, the Navy still uses titanium, of course, in thin sections for, for, tubing, for piping. Uh, we heard about that, although you need to not mix it with some other things we learned uh, so far as that goes. But there still has been an interest, although I think it's a decreasing interest, um, uh, ever since the Alpha Sub came out, um, the Soviets built the Alpha, or became public knowledge that they had the Alpha Sub in about 1980, and um, that they had leapfrogged us in submarine technology for about two years, until these things started cracking due to the creep fatigue interaction and stuff. But in the meantime, Congress was very upset, um, and uh, uh, at one time. When Millard Fireball was the uh, Millard Fireball was in your program, which used to be the 13A program, and he got a PhD. He was allowed to stay an extra year or two and got a PhD, and then he became the designer of the Seawolf submarine. When I met him, he was a captain in the late 80s, um, and then later he became chief engineer of the Navy. And then when he retired, he became a vice president at General Dynamics and was at Electric Boat. And in fact, if you look back at this. Uh, these National Academy reports have to be reviewed, and the person, one of they list, they all, all they do is list the reviewers. You don't know who the reviewer is going to be. It's an anonymous peer review until they actually publish it. And here's Millard Firebaugh, who was at Electric Boat in 2004. Um, and he was the only person among all these who could have said anything intelligent about whether my estimates were okay on cost. Um, he didn't dispute them, but we didn't know the Chinese were going to start buying lots of metals and stuff. In any case, let me talk about um, the Alpha subs and how they might have been built. Um, the first thing I'll put up or pass around was submerged arc welding. And what is submerged arc welding? Well, this, this is a submerged arc weld in titanium that I made about 1977 or 78, okay? And it was made with a calcium fluoride flux. We took single crystal optical grade calcium fluoride and we crushed it up. And submerged arc welding is a process where you can take heavy, heavy plate 
and you pour the sand on the surface, it's a granular flux, and then you take a bare wire and you, you strike an arc and the arc is submerged beneath the flux. It's not submerged in water or anything, it's submerged beneath the flux. It was, this was called Union Melt in 1936, there's a patent on it, and um, the process was used, is still used widely for steel. Uh, there's a letter from uh, Franklin Roosevelt to Winston Churchill in 1943 talking about this wonderful new welding process that was helping build ships, okay? And this is the, this is the process. Uh, invented by Union Carbide, and that's why it was called Union Melt. Well, it turns out you can weld titanium by this process. This was my first research contract as a young professor. Um, turns out Union Carbide, before it changed its name to Praxair and other things because of the Bhopal disaster, had taken a contract from the Navy to do submerged arc welding of titanium. That was in the mid-70s. The Navy was still interested in trying to weld heavy section titanium. But you had to keep the oxygen and nitrogen low in order to get good toughness in your welds. And so um, we tried submerged arc welding. Um, the flux was costing me $100 a pound. Okay, now you could probably get it cheaper, okay? Um, but we, all we could get that had the purity we needed, uh, and it would be very high, it was very hydroscopic. It, if it picked up moisture and you welded <coughs> with it, you'd get terrible oxygen levels and it wouldn't be any good. So you had to, you're going to have some problems with that. The other problem is you would, you would melt about a pound and a half of flux for every pound of titanium. Now, titanium is lighter than steel, but in steel you might, you might melt a third of a pound of flux for every pound of steel that you put as weld metal deposit. Here we had like a tenfold difference. So I did a little economic analysis for the Navy and showed, boy, this, this is going to be really expensive to use this process. And that's kind of where I was about 1980 when uh, the Alpha Sub uh, was announced. And David Taylor started holding some conferences, uh, which were, well, the conferences were, were not classified because they couldn't get everybody's security clearance. But Congress was all upset. Uh, they wanted to do something about, um, could, you know, could we build a titanium submarine and how fast and at what cost and whatnot. So it turns out about that same time I had a chance to go to the, the Soviet Union with Professor Sikeli. And I may have mentioned Professor Sikeli was this Hungarian who had gotten out of Hungary in 1956 during the revolt, went to Imperial College, and he had started at MIT the same week I did. He was a full professor. I was an assistant professor. But we were pretty good friends. And President Carter had started this um, an exchange, a scientific exchange with the Soviet Union, but and and in that first exchange, they had a metallurgical pro project funded by the National Science Foundation. But really, I think some of the money came from the State Department. And uh, the head of that metallurgical exchange was Professor Nick Grant of this department for the whole nation. And Professor Grant had grown up in the Soviet Union until he was five years old and he spoke Russian and he was a well-known metallurgist. So they put him in charge of this and the first time they had 37 scientists from the United States. They all wanted to go over to the Soviet Union and see what was going on hadn't been able to get in for years. This was like 1978. The next time they had like eight people go in that exchange and the next time it was just Professor Sikeli and he asked me if I would tag along because he didn't want to go there by himself. So I, had, I knew I wouldn't get a chance to see the Patan Institute in Kiev uh, for many years because Reagan, President Reagan was shutting down this program. The National Science Foundation had a little bit of money. The Soviets wanted to keep it going, but uh, um, uh, we were kind of the last two. So I got to spend a week in the Soviet Union, a few days in Moscow, a few days in Kiev, and um, I got to meet with Gurevich. See, there's his name. Um, well, it's a, that is his name in Cyrillic, I guess. But S.M. Gurevich. Gurevich had been publishing. This is a unclassified translation of Metallurgy and Technology of Welding Titanium and Its Alloys. Um, uh, it was translated by the U.S. Air Force. 
in April 1980. Okay, there's the translation. Here's the actual book. And here's Gurevich's um, gift to me of his book. Okay, been a little worse for wear. It's got some interesting pictures in it. You have to keep things nice and clean when you're welding titanium, keep the oxygen out. And here are some people in the Soviet Union wearing basically spacesuits. Uh, they're in a chamber where the chamber is filled with argon and they have oxygen pumped into their space chute. Okay, so they're in a, they're welding titanium components. Now, a lot of this book is how to make high purity fluxes. Okay, uh, I don't have some specific things, but they have a number of things in here on how to make high purity fluxes. So I got to sit down with Gurevich for about two hours and he would answer every question that I had. And I could tell he was answering them honestly because he was just a scientist. He didn't care about all these politics. But we discussed gas tungsten arc welding, gas metal arc welding, submerged arc welding. Uh, what else did we discuss? Uh, uh, we discussed. Well, those are most of the things that we discussed. And I think I mentioned to you, he basically said, oh, no, we don't use gas metal arc. This is what the U.S. Navy had been hanging their hat on. This is what they tried to weld the sea cliff with. This one will give you, let's say, 10 pounds an hour. This one, gas tungsten arc and titanium, may give you 2 pounds an hour. And so at Mare Island, they tried this. They tried for six months. They couldn't do it. Kept on having to cut out the welds. And finally, they finished the sea cliff with, you know, if sea cliff was about two inch thick plate. They finished it with gas tungsten arc, way over budget. Um, very slow, very expensive process. I had worked on submerged arc welding, and it turns out Garavich had been publishing about submerged arc welding in the 1960s. About 1972, he just sort of stopped publishing. Well, this was probably about the time they decided they were going to go full scale and build a titanium submarine. And he was probably told, you don't get to publish in the open literature anymore. So we were curious about how they had built the submarine because we looked at the, the cost of trying to do these things and they were just prohibitive. Of course, the Soviet Union had a different uh, scale of economics, okay? If some top politician or admiral or someone said do it, you might do it even though it you know, takes 10% of the gross domestic product, you would do it because you're told to. Uh, here we actually had to follow a little bit more of a, uh, an economic uh, rule on things. Anyway, um, so we talked a little bit about submerged arc. Um, like I said, he answered all my questions, but it was when we got back. Um, and I think it's been long enough now that I can say, I, the one time I ever really used a security clearance, the Navy actually had some evidence of how they may have built the submarine, and I can't, I'm not going to tell you how they had this evidence. But we looked at things, and actually, it was even before that, uh, before they had me in, you know, got my security clearance and I went to see it. I was at one of these unclassified civilian conferences. It was a two day conference down in Annapolis at David Taylor, and the first day was Industry Day, and the top aerospace companies, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, Northrop. Uh, and all these others were coming in, and they were talking about welding heavy section to titanium. The heaviest section we heard of in that first day was three-eighths of an inch. One person had done one weld, I think, in three-eighths of an inch. Most of the rest of the stuff, heavy to them, was a quarter inch in the aerospace industry. So the second day, it was myself, because I had been working on one-inch thick submerged arc welding, and the um, and the Navy, and the Navy had been working on one, two, and four inch thick titanium. And they actually had welding tables down at Carter Rock that were made of uh, four inch thick titanium. Well, why did they have this? Because the Air Force had tried to build a B-1 bomber, and then it got canceled, and they had tremendous amounts of titanium they had to order ahead of time. This was all 6-4. And so it was all supposedly in some... Um, uh, unused uh, runway at some Air Force base. They had thousands of tons of titanium 
in all kinds of shapes and forms of titanium 64 for the B-1 <coughs> bomber program. And the Navy convinced the Air Force when their B-1 bomber was canceled to give them that, that titanium. And so down at David Taylor, they wanted to buy a new welding table, and they didn't have the budget for it, so they just went out and got some four-inch thick titanium plate and made their own. <laughs> okay, I remember seeing that table. That table was probably worth a quarter million dollars if you had to go out and buy it, maybe more. Um, so anyway, we were at this conference, and we're talking about things, and all of a sudden, that afternoon, um, one of those afternoons, I, I all of a sudden realized how Garevich had welded a lot of the, uh, the Alpha Sub because I was thinking back to having read his papers prior to 1972 and he had talked a lot, he'd written a lot of papers on electroslag welding. Now I didn't pay too much attention to it because electroslag welding was the process that Boris Paton, the father of, uh, where, uh, I don't remember, the first Paton, the first Paton who had repaired Soviet armor tanks in World War II and became a hero of the Soviet Union for repairing tanks and started the Paton Institute in Kiev. His specialty was electroslag welding where he used two vertical plates, heavy section plates. These could be one to four inches thick. I mean, I've seen people do eight inches thick. And you put two copper dams, water-cooled copper dams, on the side to make a little vertical cavity and you bring an electrode in, you put some flux in here. Now you don't have to use, you know, three pounds of flux for every pound of weld metal. You can use one pound of flux and put down 50 pounds of weld metal, okay? So the flux is not a big cost. And so I had to, um, actually asked uh, one of the guys at Carter Rock to come out in the hall with me and I said, I know how they did it. They did electroslag, at least that's one of the processes. You can only make vertical wells like this, but if you go down to electric boat today, or to Quonset Point, that's how they make the basic hull longitudinal wells. They turn the, they turn the, the cylinder, the, you know, the, if the cylinder's this way in the water, they turn it this way to weld it, and they make four wells, approximately. Uh, actually, maybe you make more than four wells. Uh,